Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, welcome to the course on medical biomaterials. We will continue on the topic of uh, animal studies. The most important thing in animal studies is the animal ethics. Yes, especially when you are doing experiments with animals, we need to look at uh, the ethical issues and uh, we need to follow those ethical guidelines. Uh, generally, uh, any research organization, if they have an animal house, they will always have an animal ethical committee. So, this committee will look at uh, what type of experiments that are going to be performed and um, whether they are abiding by the guidelines and so on actually. Okay. So, they have to get permission from the animal ethical committee before experiments are carried out in um, with animals. So, what are these? Animals are allowed um, for development of drugs and va vaccines and animals are used before they always go into um, human volunteer trials. Okay. And even when uh, the clinicians or surgeons are looking at new surgical techniques, uh, trying to understand certain new concepts, then um, they have to perform on animals. These animals, like I said in the previous class, it could be small animals, large animals, right? Sometimes going right up to horse, starting from mouse. Okay, so depending upon the type of uh, animal studies they want to do. So quite a lot of animals are used uh, globally for research um, per year. Um, and um, many countries have the mandate that animal studies have to be done before they are taken into human volunteers. There are three important guiding principles when you are looking at animals. They are called the three R's okay, in animal research. One is called the replacement, other is called the reduction, other is called the refinement. What is this replacement? You need to understand whether there are any alternates available. Okay, which uses non-animal studies. For example, can I use cell lines, can I use computer simulation techniques um, and so on. Of course, uh, computer simulation techniques have not developed so much that uh, it can completely replace uh, animal studies and similarly cell lines uh, are not completely uh, replica of animals. So, we need to still do animal studies. Reduction, can we use uh, less number of animals? Um, but at the same time get statistically significant uh, information. Okay. So, can I use a smaller set of animals? Um, can I do um, an implant on two sides of the same animal that way I will number of animals can be reduced. So, you need to think about all those that is called the reduction. Refinement, can I improve the experimental strategy so that uh, the experimental strategy is well refined so that the animals uh, do not um, undergo too much pain, they have minimal pain, okay. the experimental duration could be short and um, quick and the data is collected in a very efficient manner that is called refinement. So, the main guiding principle in animal testing is the replacement, reduction and refinement. Okay. So, uh, any ethical committee will ask these questions, can you reduce the number of uh, uh, animals? Can you have experiments which does not use animals or are you refining your experimental strategy so that the, the animals do not face too much pain or the experimental duration is much smaller and so on actually. So, there are a lot of guidelines, regulations uh, so that the animals are treated humanely as possible. Okay. That is very, very important. Something called guide for care and use of laboratory animals. There are certain um, Okay, guidelines available, the guide for care and use of agricultural animals in agricultural research and teaching okay, like a sheep, goat, cow and so on. Uh, report for the AVMA panel on euthanasia in case uh, animals have to be sacrificed, uh, how humanely it is possible without causing pain. Guidelines for the use of fish in research, okay. um, American uh, guideline which looks at animal care and use policies animal welfare act regulations, public health service policies. So, there are a lot of guidelines available um, both uh, in Europe as well as in USA uh, for treating of animals of various types 
for uh, the euthanasia and so on actually. Okay, there is something called a committee for the purpose of control and supervision of experiments on animals. This committee uh, I am sure uh, has to be there uh, in any organization which handles animal, uh, which conducts uh, tests of various types, be it drug discovery, where, uh, be it uh, biomaterial studies and so on actually. So, this is the CPCSEA. This is a committee that have been empowered by law to ensure all research activities involving animals satisfies the federal, state and local regulations and policy, both uh, governing the use of animals and research. Okay? So, that they have uh, uh, the mandate to look at all the um, research activities that are going on uh, with related to animals. Okay? So, there is a chairperson, there has to be a veterinarian, a doctor um, who is an expert in handling of animals, scientist, okay? scientist who has done research in animals. Then there has to be non-scientific members. Okay? Um, so, a non-scientific members looks at it in a different angle and tells whether the experiments uh, that are going to be conducted um, is really important, whether the animals face uh, um, pain uh, and uh, whether it is done humanely and so on. That is the non-scientific members. Then there are non-affiliated members. That means, people who are not affiliated with the research organization, outsiders who are more interested in the community as a general, okay, community are large. So, people who are looking at it as a community uh, based uh, issues. So, those are also members who are inducted into this particular committee. So, we have a chairman, we have a veterinary surgeon, we have scientists who is going to be conducting the experiments, who is very well exp uh, experienced. Then there are non-scientific members uh, who does not have much science background, but they may have other um, background. And then members who are inducted from outside the organization. So, they are more uh, interested in the welfare of the community at large. So, all these people form this committee and uh, they go through the uh, protocols or the experimental uh, strategy uh, which is uh, designed and they try to understand it and they use all the three important uh, principles, the three R's and then make suggestions which are implemented before the experiments are started. So, what are the responsibilities of the CPCSEA? They review and approve all research, whether it is uh, research, teaching or testing activities that makes use of animals, okay? small animals, large animals and so on actually. They look at whether there are no alternatives to using animals and the research is not duplicated. If the data is already available, why carry out that research? So, they might not approve if it is a duplication and uh, they also look at whether these experiments are relevant to human or animal health. Okay? So, it has to have some purpose, especially maybe if it is a drug for human or it is a drug for animals. So, you need to test it out a priori before they are actually tested on human or animals. Okay? So, whether it is relevant and it is good for the society. So, it is not that I want to do an experiment um, just for the sake of doing experiment but there has to be an end point where the society at large comes into picture. So, we need to consider that angle as well. Okay? So, the CPC SEA looks at all these aspects before they actually give permission uh, to the um, organization for conducting the experiment. So, they look at the procedures. So, they look at each and every protocol and then approve it to be that to be conducted on animals and then they identify potential painful and stressful procedures. Okay? So, if there are going to be any procedures that are going to be painful, um, can the animals be given medications okay? or can we completely eliminate uh, these procedures or can we minimize this pain and distress. And then they also monitor the research activity to ensure only whatever has been reviewed and approved by the CPCA is followed. Okay? So, it is not that uh, the uh, the experiment does something different from what has been approved by the CPCA. They also inspect the living quarters of animals, okay, maybe twice a year they come and see whether the animals um, have a good uh, facility, animals are checked daily, their housing facilities are clean, 
and uh, the space for each animal is sufficient for their well being as well as for the production, production in that they are re regularly received fresh food and water. There are appropriate for the species being uh, used. For example, um, if it is rats, there are certain guidelines uh, in which they have to be housed. If it is a guinea pig, there are certain guidelines. If it is a bigger animal like dog or sheep or goat, then there are certain guidelines for their housing, for their food and water. So, whether they are followed and they are receiving proper veterinary care, that is also important. So, there has to be a full time veterinary surgeon who takes care of the well being of these animals. So, that is the overview of the CPCSEA. Then, then of course, there is another committee that is called the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, okay, IACUC. Uh, so, they look at uh, uh, whether the number of animals are enough to yield the statistically valid results. So, they neither want to have too many animals nor too little animals which are not statistically significant, whether the appropriate species of animal is being used for the project. Like I showed you some time back, if you are talking about cardiovascular stent, what type of animals? If you are looking at joint, what type of animals? If you are looking at just cytotoxicity, what type of animals and so on. So, the appropriate species of animal. And humane experimental endpoints have been established. That means, there has to be a start and end. We are studying uh, the biodegradability of a polymer over a period of 30 days. So, that is the start and end point. So, that is also very important. So, there has to be an end point. So, it is not an open ended uh, research which they are doing. And then whether they are using appropriate methods for euthanasia, if the animal is sacrificed, okay, uh, how it is being done. Uh, what procedures are being done so that the animal does not uh, face uh, pain uh, when it is uh, sacrificed. So, all these uh, issues needs to be uh, looked at and which is being looked at by the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. So, there are quite a lot of uh, uh, overseeing committees um, which uh, not only monitor the well being of the animal, but they also review the experimental procedure strategy, they give a lot of suggestions modifications with respect to the 3R and if there is any um, animal has to be sacrificed, how painlessly they are to be handled and uh, so on. So, these committees take care of all these issues. Okay. Okay. So, uh, let us look at a, a couple, a few case studies um, which, we have been, which we have performed using animals uh, looking at the biomaterial with respect to their biocompatibility or biodegradability. Okay. So, um, imagine I am looking at the biocompatibility of a certain polymeric uh, system in vivo. Um, I might have a priori done with cell lines. I talked about an assay called MTT or MTS assay, which looks at cell proliferation. Um, so, after doing that, you want to move to the animal uh, and look at the biocompatibility in biological environment, because uh, uh, when you when you keep it inside the animal, um, it is phasing uh, enzymes, proteins, so on. So, the way these material behave there may be very much different the way they behave in cell line. Okay? So, um, we had done some experiments, I want to show you some of these results. Okay? So, we were looking at in vivo biocompatibility and biodegradation of uh, a polymer called uh, uh, polylactic glycolic acid. Uh, um, which is uh, uh, supposed to be um, an alternate uh, use in stents, ureteral stents, currently polyurethane is used. Um, so, we want to look at uh, this PLGA in animal model, male Vister rats. So, we have about 6 rats per batch, so uh, with the control and with the test and so on. So, the age weight about 6 weeks, 180, 200 grams. So, these polymers are placed intraperitoneally. Um, and then uh, sued back and after 30 days they are removed and then um, the biodegradation of the polymer can be studied using weight loss and um, by looking at the tissues one can look at whether the polymer ha causes any cytotoxicity or uh, uh, whether it is harmless to the surrounding tissues and also look at uh, systemic toxicity whether the polymer in those 30 days um, causes toxicity to the system as well. So, this type of uh, cytotoxic studies, these are very normally done. 
Um, you can do it for short period or medium period or long period. Like I said, around 30 days um, is what is studied if you are talking about uh, uh, longer duration um, studies. Okay? So, after 30 days, you take out the sample out which is placed intraperitoneally and look at um, not only the changes in the polymer, uh, or you can also look at uh, any change in systemic toxicity to the rats as well. Okay? Uh, then uh, you can take out uh, certain tissue samples, okay, tissue samples from the ha heart and then see whether there is changes um, after it has been placed the polymer for 30 days. So, you can prove that there are no changes in the arrangement of myocardial fibers. We can take out kidney samples and then we can see whether there is uh, any changes with respect to control. We can look at the liver samples and then uh, with the control as well as with the polymer placed and see whether any changes has happened and also we can take tissues from the brain and see there are no inflammation. So, um, this type of studies are commonly done um, to look at the cytotoxicity both the um, acute as well as chronic and also systemic toxicity. So, we can take tissues from different parts um, of the uh, animal and see whether there is a change because the material has been placed for 30 days intraperitoneal um, with respect to the control. Okay. Um, okay, so, similarly uh, okay, that is with respect to inflammation. Then we can also look at uh, whether there are any um, gen cells that have been formed, whether there are any connectivity tissues have been formed, whether there is any collagen network that has been formed and so on. Um, again, uh, uh, here I am showing you an example where we have looked at uh, uh, polyurethane. Polyurethane is widely used in uh, stents, uh, they are used in breast implants, they are used in many places actually in tubes um, and so on actually. Uh, we have two different modifications that are done to polyurethane and they are placed intraperitoneal for 30 days and then we retrieve the implant, look at the histopathological studies. We can also look at uh, um, fibrous encapsulation around, around that polymer, is there any collagen that has been formed. In the previous study, we talked about inflammation, here we are, we are talking about um, what are the changes that are happening to the connective tissues, um, okay, tissue response. Okay, so, uh, we can sort of uh, from the histopathology data, we can count the number of uh, um, tissue, different types of tissues that are formed okay, and then um, we can sort of uh, quantify them here. This is the control, these are two different modifications to the control. Okay, after one month of uh, implantation, we are looking at different types of uh, uh, tissues that have formed, acute inflammatory response, the macrophages, giant cells okay, and uh, fibroblastic tissue, collagen network. Okay. And then uh, we look at each one of these uh, um, okay. polymer, effect of each one of these polymer. Um, so, we say when we, when we give a scale of 0, we say it is not present when you give just plus or minus, we say it is occasionally present, when it is present, then we say it is present to a mild degree, when we say 2 plus, then it is present to a moderate degree, 3 plus, we will say marked degree, 4 plus very high. Okay? So, this is how it is scored. So, basically it is a qualitative representation of the uh, observations. Okay? So, this is the control, we say acute inflammatory cells, it is found to a very high degree. Okay? Whereas, uh, in the modified system which found to a marked degree in one modification it is found to a moderate degree. So, there is a decrease in the inflammatory cells okay, um, as we modify the control polymer. Macrophages it is found in marked degree on the control um, and then it goes down to almost very mild degree that means, amount of macrophages found um, uh, on the um, animal model um, on this modified system goes down from a marked degree to very mild degree. If you look at the giant cells, uh, it is found quite a lot on the control, but it comes down quite drastically uh, which is say occasionally found. Same thing on fibroblastic tissues um, from a marked degree, 
it comes down to almost uh, mild and um, collagen network it is found to a moderate degree to almost to occasionally present. So, um, the effect of uh, these modifications with respect to the control um, is sort of uh, uh, determined in a very qualitative way and it gives you a very nice picture okay, on the uh, formation of various types of uh, cells, um, network and inflammatory response. Okay. Okay. So, this is a very interesting uh, study one can do uh, using animal models and as you can see we cannot do that sort of study um, in a in vitro cell line. We can look at the inflammatory markers um, like uh, TNF alpha or IL beta which I showed you uh, because of the um, contact of uh, the cells with the biomaterial. But if you want to look at fibroblast, collagen network, giant cells, then obviously we need to do some type of uh, animal studies. We cannot do it uh, um, in the in vitro condition. Okay, and uh, we can do some qualitative um, quantification. Okay, and uh, as you can see in this table, um, a modification to the polymer brings down uh, these uh, uh, tissue response dramatically with respect to the control. Okay. So, tissue response we cannot study in uh, cell lines, but you have to study uh, of course, in, in uh, a vivo model like a Wister rat. Okay. Another example I want to show you, we were looking at uh, wound healing, okay. um, develop polymeric uh, material for wound healing applications. Okay. So, we have uh, um, create wound on the surface of rats. Okay, and then um, we look at look at uh, how um, the various polymeric uh, uh, combinations blends. Um, this is a polymeric combination gel 25 um, using a glucon, okay, and a carrageenan, where 25 percent of it is a cyclic glucon, remaining is carrageenan. Here, same polymer but with the ciprofloxin, which is an antibacterial. Uh, when you have an open wound, uh, bacterial infection could be a problem. So, we, we can see whether the ciprofloxing helps in preventing the um, bacterial growth and then this is a commercial product as a positive control. So, we have a control where we do not give any treatment, then we have a, a um, combination of a, a cyclic glucon and carrageenan, um, hydrogel uh, tre treated the wound. And this is same thing with the ciprofloxin, this is a commercial product. So, here we are talking about about 6 rats in each case. So, here we create an wound on the surface and then, um, then these different treatments are given. Then you monitor how the wound area contracts as a function of time. Uh, you do these experiments for about 7 days and then see how uh, it contracts as a function of time and then we see whether there is a statistical improvement because of uh, these type of uh, new polymeric uh, designs okay? and that is what uh, one does actually. So, these pictures show you uh, the wounds okay, on um, control without treatment with the um, carrageenan and um, cyclic glucon. This is with the so carrageenan, cyclic glucon and ciprofloxin. This is a commercial product okay? um, and so on with the different time periods day 1, day 4, day 7 and so on. Uh, we can uh, quantify the wound contraction area and uh, represent it beautifully uh, in this type of bar graph. So, what does it tell? Um, as um, we go up in days, okay, this is with the ciprofloxin um, hydrogel, this is without ciprofloxin, this is a commercial product, this is the control. Okay. So, we can see uh, the wound contraction is very, very high, very fast within 2 days we find a very high wound contraction when compared to the control or with the commercial product uh, okay? and then the contraction rate increases dramatically okay, within the eighth day when compared to say control. Okay? The wound contraction after eight days in control is only 60 percent or 70 percent whereas it is almost 100 percent. The wound is completely um, healed as you can see here okay? in day 8, uh, this is the day 0 and um, wound is still not uh, healed fully um, in the control where you do not give any treatment. Okay. So, you can see this 
This is with ciprofloxacin and with ciprofloxacin, this is a commercial product. Okay. So, um, this particular hydrogel uh, seemed to work uh, reasonably well and uh, these type of experiments uh, are carried out and have to be carried out using uh, this type of uh, uh, animal models. Okay. Without that, one could not go uh, further for testing it out on human. Okay. So, we also can look at uh, in addition to the wound contraction, we can look at whether the collagen network formation is good um, so that the wound gets completely healed because that is more of a uh, tissue response. Okay. Um, like I have been telling for a long time, so you will have an inflammatory response, then you have a tissue response and so on. So, the major constant of collagen um, is called hydroxyproline. So, we can monitor uh, taking out samples from here, um, what is the hydroxyproline content and which is a marker, biomarker it is said uh, which tells you uh, how the wound gets con contraction rate is good. So, as you can see here, okay, the hydroxyproline content is uh, quite good okay, um, when, when compared to the control or with ciprofloxacin and without ciprofloxacin. Okay, we see yeah, quite a big increase uh, in the hydroxyproline content with respect to control. That means, the, the network of collagen is also growing. One is the wound contraction and then the collagen network uh, also growing very well um, so that the wound gets completely cured. Okay. So, the hydrogel treated wounds are moist, uh, no sign of infection, inflammation and the healing rate is also very high, uh, almost more than 90 percent in 8 days when compared to the control or commercial products. And the high level of hydroxyproline, uh, which gives you an idea about uh, the increase in the uh, collagen uh, buildup and the coverage of the wound is also very, very high with respect to the control. So, um, I have given you a few um, case studies or examples where uh, use of uh, animals, small animals is extremely uh, important before one goes into um, human volunteers. These uh, studies which I showed you with small animals mostly looking at cytotoxicity, uh, we can look at biodegradation of polymer, we can look at uh, uh, the wound healing properties, we can look at uh, the tissue formation uh, and whether there are any uh, collagen network formation um, when a material is implanted intraperitoneally. Of course, um, uh, you need bigger animals if you want to look at say joint replacement or if you want to look at cardiovascular stenting because uh, the rats uh, have very, very small uh, um, sized uh, um, joints as well as veins. So, you may have to go for higher animals like dogs and sheep and so on if you want to look at um, other type of studies. Okay. So, the rats, Mr. Rats or rabbits, uh, okay, they are very extremely good for the type of studies examples which I showed you just like uh, such as cytotoxicity, such as biodegradability, such as formation of collagen network, such as inflammatory responses, uh, wound healing and uh, so on actually. Okay? Um, so, thank you very much uh, for your uh, time.